Thank you very much, and, and thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be to be talking about our recent work work here in this this virtual workshop. So uh, I will indeed be be talking about uh, quark matter cores in, in massive neutron stars eventually, but uh, the results I'll be showing are from a from quite a few different papers with uh, from collaboration with uh, many different uh, different people from both Helsinki and and elsewhere, uh, for instance, Emily Annala, Tyler Goda, Alexi Kurkela, Saga Sappi, Jonas Nattilan, and uh, Paul Romatske. Uh, and the main three main references are indicated here. Uh, perhaps the last one, a very recent Nature Physics, we we published this summer is, is the most sort of most relevant one. Um, unfortunately, if, uh, this uh, this paper is not to be found from the archive, at least in any any recent form so so to get it you should you have to go to the nature website but fortunately it's open access so so you can certainly certainly access it from anywhere but uh, to start of course the main quantity uh, that we are interested in at least in in uh, the realm of, of qcd theorists is the phase diagram of, of qcd or, or quantum chromodynamics i'm sure that you have seen many variations of, of this diagram also in during this week so uh, not going to go to all the details here. Uh, I think it's it's clear that the main while there are many details details in this phase diagram that have not been been fully worked out yet. For instance, whether there is a first order phase transition at some point and a critical critical uh, uh, point on the on the phase diagram and, and then a first order transitional uh, deconfinement transition line starting from there. This is an open question, but somehow the qualitative feature has been known for decades that if you take ordinary QCD matter in the form of, of a hadron gas or a hadron liquid, and then you either increase the temperature or, or the density of the system. So, so in essence, the energy density in the system enough, you end up in, in this famous deconfined phase that is either referred to as, as quark form plasma at high temperatures or cold quark matter at, at low temperatures and high densities. And now this is not just for theoretical interest, but, but uh, it is possible to experimentally study, especially this QGP phase. And here, of course, the, the relevant tool is, is ultra-relativistic heavy ion collisions. Uh, and and uh, both at, at RIC uh, and at the LHC in CERN, uh, we have been studying, studying heavy ion collisions for, for quite some time. And, and convincingly, we have seen the production of of the deconfined phase quark quantum plasma there. But then there is this other realm, as, as you all know, neutron stars that this workshop is, is all about. And, and here the relevant or the mo most interesting and, and relevant fact is that uh, the only place in the current universe where density is high enough uh, so that this quark matter phase could be reached are produced or, or may be produced is in the cores of, of neutron stars. And, and therefore, neutron stars are, are very interesting laboratories also from the point of view of, of QCD physics. But what I would like to emphasize here is that uh, these two laboratories, even though they are seeming, seemingly very different, heavy ion collision experiments and, and the study of neutron stars, they really share a lot in common. So first of all, they are the only existing systems uh, in, in today's universe where we can access energy densities of the order of, of one GB or Fermi cubed, or, or perhaps even, even more, which is, is uh, expected to be enough for producing this, this deconfined phase. Now, in both cases, we are interested in, in many different properties, uh, the equilibrium thermodynamics that ultimately gives rise also to the structure of the phase diagram and, and also, in principle, equilibration dynamics, thermalization, in the context of, of uh, heavy ion collisions and, and then the sort of dynamics of, of uh, what, what happens in neutron star mergers and, and supernova explosions in the, in the context of compact star physics. Now, in both cases, there are some challenges in the first principles description, theoretical description of these systems. With heavy ion collisions, the, the challenges are typically related to the sort of early dynamics, not so much anymore to the bulk thermodynamic properties of of the quark-gluon plasma, but, but the dynamics of, of the heavy ion 
collision system. While in, in on the neut neutron star side, of course, as, as you all know, we have many open questions also, also in, in very basic properties like the structure of the phase diagram, how the equation of state and, and similar bulk thermo thermodynamic quantities behave and so on. And finally, of course, in, in both cases, the, the goals are very similar. We want to discover deconfined matter. We want to measure the properties of these systems and, and thereby both understand the theory in a more deep or deeper way and, and also be able to ultimately map this phase diagram more accurately than what has been, been possible up to today. Now, uh, before going to, to neutron stars, um, let me just sort of try to summarize in a very simple and, and brief way what are sort of the main lessons, at least in, in my opinion, that we have uh, gained from decades of, of studying heavy ion collisions, both using experiments and also studying hot quark one plasma uh, you know, on the lattice, because of course a, a big difference to, to uh, dense and cold QCD is that for hot, hot quark one plasma at high temperatures and small densities, there is a first principles non perturbative tool, namely lattice Monte Carlo simulations, that uh, enables us to, to uh, compute many different properties of the system in a very reliable and, and controlled fashion. So perhaps the, the most, at least from, from the point of view of, of bulk thermodynamics, the most important single fact that we have learned in particular from, from lattice uh, simulations is that the, the deconfinement and chiral transitions, they are both crossovers and they take place at a temperature of roughly 150, 155 MeV and an energy density in the system, which is of the order of, of 400 MeV over Fermi cubed or so. And this is visible quite clearly from, from this left, left figure taken from a, a paper of the Bupetal Budapest collaboration that shows that uh, there really is no jump, jump uh, in, in the pressure or its derivatives when the temperature is is increased, but rather there is a smooth crossover transition somewhere around here, 150, 160, 60 MeV. And, and uh, even this transition in this transition region, hadron resonance gas calculations still work quite nicely. And, and then when you go to somewhat higher, higher temperatures, also perturbation st theory starts to work. Now, uh, when we proceed from this, um, this sort of transition, region onwards, then what happens is that there is, is a fairly rapid but, but very smooth approach towards a re regime where, as I said, uh, region perturbation theory is already starting to work. The, these uh, sort of dash dotted lines are predictions from, from uh, so-called so uh, half thermal loop perturbation theory, where the, the uncertainties or error bars are taken very, in a very conservative fashion. But as you, you can see, there is at least a, a nice qualitative, even quantitative agreement between the HDL predictions already from something like two or three times the, the deconfinement uh, critical temperature onwards. And, and uh, while this transition is happening, what happens to the system is that it, it also approaches uh, a kind of conformal behavior, whereby conformal, I mean, the, the predictive behavior of, of a scale-free system. We, of course, know that asymptotically, quark one plasma should behave like a conformal uh, system. The, the only, when, when we go to temperature so high that, that uh, the temperature is much larger than any, um, uh, than lambda QCD or any of the quark masses, then the temperature is really the only dimensionful relevant quantity in the system and, and everything like, for instance, the pressure has to, has to just all physical quantities have to scale with some, some powers of, of the temperature that can be, can be uh, found by, by simple dimensional analysis. Also, uh, gamma, the polytropic index becomes one very soon after, after this uh, phase transition region and the speed of sound always remains below the conformal value, one over square root of three which it approaches uh, at very high temperatures. And then finally, um, you probably have, have uh, all heard that uh, there's been a great success of, of holographic or, or in more general terms, strong coupling 
uh, tools in the description of, of, for instance, the transport properties of, of uh, hot quark gluon plasma. We know that uh, sort of quark gluon plasma close to this deconfinement transition seems to almost saturate this famous Eda over S equals one over four pi prediction from, from holography. And also in, in, if you want to describe thermalization in heavy ion calculations or heavy, heavy, heavy ion collisions, then uh, sort of holography has turned out to be a very useful tool. But at least for bulk thermodynamic quantities, as I briefly mentioned, it seems that uh, you don't have to go far away from, from the transition, only two or three times, times uh, the critical pseudocritical temperature of the deconfinement transition that you already run into a regime where resumed perturbation theory works very nicely. And now uh, the remainder of, of my talk today, in, in the remainder of my talk today, the main question that I will be addressing is, is quite simply how all of what I have described so far will generalize to neutron star physics. For instance, uh, we know that there is this famous sign pro problem of lattice QCD that means that we don't have uh, lattice methods or lattice results available anymore at high uh, densities and, and low temperatures. How can we remedy for this in the case of if we're interested in, in uh, cold and dense QCD matter and, and quark matter in particular? On the other hand, there's clearly a, a difference in, in how to how we can, what, what kinds of observational results we have in heavy ion collisions and, and in neutron star physics, uh, how can we optimally exploit all the observational information we have on, on neutron stars. And then finally, a question that I, I will be addressing uh, at the end of, of my talk is whether we can already at this point say something model independent about whether quark matter cores are likely to exist in, inside uh, neutron stars and if yes, in what kinds of stars do we have quark matter cores and how large are they? Good. Are there any questions so far? Or uh, shall I just, perhaps I will then continue. Sir, one second. Can you just uh, keep your microphone a little far from your mouth? There is from breathing noise we are getting. Little oh, bit sorry. of little far. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, so, so let me then, then uh, continue and, and uh, to going towards neutron stars, starting from, from the neutron star matter equation of state and, and discuss what we actually know robustly about this quantity. Now first, uh, wh when we talk about the equation of state of neutron star matter, <laughs> the first obvious question is wh why, why is this quantity so important? And, and you all of course know this, it's because the tolman oppenheimer folkov equations state that it's really the equation of state, the functional relationship between the energy density and pressure of, of the matter that somehow connects the microscopic world to the macroscopic world in, in neutron stars. So if we know the equation of state, this function epsilon as a function of P or, or P as a function of epsilon, whichever way you want to, want to give it, and you plug it into the T of the equations in the non-rotational form here, then what you obtain is in principle a unique prediction for the mass radius curve on top of which all the neutron star observations should collapse if we accurately knew the, the equation of state. Now, of course, the story is not this simple by far. Actually, if you look at, uh, look at different model predictions from, from nuclear theory, you can see that there are, uh, they are kind of all over the place. I mean, um, there, there have been some, some model independent studies of, of the quantity, but, but most of the results that can be discovered from, from the literature are uh, results derived in some particular uh, model, some, some kind of an idealization of QCD. And then even though these predictions for the equation of state are typically very precise, they come with certain assumptions that may or may not be, be uh, physically correct. And hence you have, you typically have a very wide range of, of predictions, not only for the equation of state, but also for the, for the mass radius relation. So, so uh, if we want to somehow remedy for, for this issue, we, if we want to, to work on a very model independent level, we, we uh, clearly need to do something else. 
And to prepare for this, this kind of approach, let me just, just uh, quickly mention that there are many different ways of, of uh, parameterizing the equation of state. What I will be typically using is, is uh, I will be showing the pressure as a function of either the baryon or mass density of, of the matter or the baryon or quark chemical potentials. These are, of course, quantities that uh, grow uh, when you start from the, from the crust or, or from the surface of a neutron star and go deeper towards the core and the center of the star. Both the chemical potential increases and also, also the density of the system increases actually so much so that in, in the centers of neutron stars, we typically expect to see, see densities of the order of, of five or perhaps even more times the, the saturation density of, of nuclear matter. And, and here, of course, the composition of the matter is, is dramatically different than in the outer layers of, of neutron stars. But what, what can we say about the, the equation of state? So if, if one wants to, to sort of really stick to ab initio results, then I, I would claim that, that the safest uh, method to pick at low densities is to uh, either work with sort of potential models where the, the potentials are very, very heavily constrained by nuclear physics experiments, or then at somewhat low, uh, higher densities, uh, use the chiral effective theory, uh, theory um, framework, which uh, nowadays gives you the, the equation of state of, of uh, neutron star matter, beta equilibrated, equilibrated neutron star matter, or, or pure neutron matter, or whatever you're interested in up to roughly the, the nuclear saturation density, or perhaps a little bit above that. So if we take the results from, from these uh, papers by the Darmstadt group of, of Achim Schwenk and, and others, then the uncertainties that this CET equation of state turns out to have at a density of 1.1 of nuclear saturation density is about plus or minus 24%, which is uh, regrettably quite far away from from uh, the region where we expect the centers of neutron stars to lie. Now, fortunately, of course, this is not everything that we know about, about the equation of state. We also know that QCD is an asymptotically free theory. We know that at some very, very high uh, chemical potentials, when we are uh, safely in the quark matter phase, but also the interactions have been, have been uh, getting weaker due the, to the asymptotic freedom, then this curve, the pressure as a function of, of quark chemical potentials should approach this curve that corresponds to a system of free quarks. But of course, this knowledge alone is, is, doesn't buy us very much because we don't know fr from this curve alone how this approach should be, like wh when we actually reach this, this asymptotic limit. And naively, one might even expect that somehow starting from this, this quark matter side and uh, using perturbative techniques or weak coupling techniques should not get us, us very far because clearly it's, it's not even given that neutron star cores contain quark matter at all. And then clearly these kinds of weak coupling techniques cannot give us anything on the nuclear matter side one would expect. Now I, I dare to claim that this is too pessimistic a view and, and uh, the way I would, I would explain this claim is that we have a very similar situation at high temperatures when we try to describe hot quark lone plasma yeah, that is, is produced in heavy ion collisions. So there we have a long history of uh, not only doing these lattice Monte Carlo calculations or simulations of, of quantities like the equation of state here given as the pressure as a function of, of temperature, this, this uh, kind of dark uh, band here, here uh, represents the, the lattice results. But also uh, we have a long history of free summed perturbation theory represented by this orange band in here. And as I already mentioned earlier, there is, is quite a nice quantitative agreement from something like 400, 500 uh, MeBs onwards. And I should also, by the way, note here that that at least a simple-minded use of, of uh, simplified models like the MIT back model will give you something that's qualitatively wrong. The, the approach of the, the typical MIT back model 
equations of state towards uh, the free limit is not logarithmic like it should be, but it's it's sort of one plus a constant over mu uh, or t squared type of a power law behavior that takes you to the free limit way too too fast. Now, if you want to do similar calculations at at high density and, and zero temperature, then of course the sort of most uh, pressing uh, thing that you notice here is the fact that there is no lattice result available at all because of the sign problem. But on the other hand, we have performed perturbative QCD calculations to three loops and even beyond to a partial four loop order. This is actually what we are doing all the time in, in my group. And uh, at the moment, the state of the art result looks like this. It doesn't converge quite as nicely as, as the sort of free summed uh, high temperature counterparts because we haven't yet been able to, to perform any kind of a resummation for this result. But nevertheless, it's, it's far from clear that uh, this kind of a result is, is completely useless in the neutron star context. And I, I should mention that we, uh, while this result that you see here is from a tree loop calculation from 2009, we have, by, by uh, Alexi Kurkala, myself and Paul Romachke, we have also been able to, to uh, uh, generalize this, this result to a, a partial four loop order. We have published the, the G, the a six log squared G order about two years ago. And, and hopefully later this year, we will be publishing the next order, which is, is the G of the six log G order in this expansion. Now, if you take these current results here to the, the neutron star matter, uh, result or, or equation of state plot that I showed before, then you see that the re reason why we have had this, this vertical dotted line here all along is that uh, at, at high chemical potentials is that this is the point when the uncertainty in these um, perturbative uh, results is as large as the uncertainty in the, the CET result at 1.1 saturation density. In terms of of uh, the baryon number density, we are here at something like 40 times the, the saturation density, while here we are, are roughly at one. So it's not at all clear uh, whether this result is or, or is not useful at, in, in the range of densities that we encounter in, in neutron star centers, where, where we expect the density to be of the order of maybe five to eight saturation densities or, or so. Now, uh, there were lots of, of sort of computational details in, in, uh, in these results that I, I was describing, but somehow if I, I had to really summarize everything so far, I would say that what, what we have seen is that if you are only willing to use first principles of initial methods, then the equation of state or pressure of neutron star matter is well under control at low densities up to roughly this nuclear matter saturation density, plus then at very high densities, starting from roughly 40 times the saturation density. But in between, there is this sort of no man's land where we don't really know what to, what to do, at least with these methods I've been using so far. Now, there are, of course, many different ways onwards from here. Uh, the traditional way would, of course, be to use your favorite model for for uh, dense QCD matter. Maybe we could also try holography, which has worked out very nicely at, at uh, high temperatures. Or the third possibility, which I'm, I will be following in the remainder of my talk, is to just take these sort of robust first principles results as given, and then interpolate the equation of state in between. So kind of circumvent all these problems that we have at at moderate densities and, and just try to see how far we can get by allowing all therm thermodynamically consistent behaviors for the equation of state in between and then, then somehow uh, constraining this, this result using observational data. Good. So now uh, the next relevant question of course is what we know from observations but since this uh, part of my talk is, is something that you have already been discussing quite a few times during this week, I will be very brief in here and, and just uh, sort of briefly explain what kinds of results we will be using in this interpolation cal calculations at 
that uh, I will be whose results I will be showing you later in the talk. So of course the most fundamental uh, quantity or in some sense the simplest quantity that we can measure from a neutron star is its mass. And, and there are already several dozens of, of neutron stars with fairly accurately known masses. And here by far the most interesting quantity is, is uh, what is the mass of, of the heaviest reliably known neutron star. And here uh, I know that there, there are some recent, uh, recent reports of even heavier neutron stars, one with, with, a, with the most likely mass of 2.14 solar masses that have been presented lately, but I want to be very conservative here and I will simply note that there have been now uh, so many accurate measurements of roughly two solar mass stars that it's a very safe bet to say that two solar mass stars exist and the maximal mass of neutron stars therefore has to be above two solar masses. Now the reason why this is important is, is of course because it immediately allows us to discard many uh, sort of model and, and also interpolate equations of state that predict maximal neutron star masses below this red horizontal line in here. Now perhaps the next most natural quantity to be discussing is then the neutron star radius. But this is uh, so much more complicated observationally that we have so far decided not to directly use these results, uh, results in sort of as input in our calculations. So let me just briefly uh, remind you that there have been lots of, of very interesting advances lately during the past 10 years in, in uh, sort of observing X-ray emission from, from the surface, surfaces of neutron stars. And, and for some individual stars, this has led to fairly accurate uh, radius measurements that kind of consistently point towards 12 kilometers or maybe a little bit higher 12.5 kilometers being the, the sort of most likely uh, ballpark figure for neutron star radii. So I will, I repeat that I will not be using any of these, this as input in the uh, calculations whose results I will be discussing later today, but later on I will sort of compare our results to, to these kinds of, of measurements. But a third type of very robust uh, sort of observational information from, from neutron stars is then of course ha has to do with these uh, gravitational wave measurements by LIGO and Virgo of, of uh, neutron stars undergoing mergers. And here in particular, the 2017 event, the famous first, first observed neutron star mer merger has turned out to be very, very useful. Now there are in principle many different types of potential inputs from, from uh, uh, sort of observed gravitational waves and observed neutron star mergers ranging from, from tidal deformabilities to uh, electromagnetic counterparts of, of these stars. They all in principle uh, contain very interesting information, but again, to be sort of uh, minimally speculative and maximally robust, I will only be using results from, from the tidal deformabilities. So uh, sort of equations that, that uh, you have certainly seen many times this week, uh, defining the tidal deformability, the capital lambda in this, this figure is basically a measure of how uh, the structure of a neutron star reacts to an external quadrupolar field, the gravitational field of, of its companion in a neutron star merger. And importantly, non-zero values of this, this parameter in, in this very widely used dimensionless form uh, where, where sort of relevant values for the tidal deformability are, are some hundreds. Uh, importantly, it has been seen in, in simulations, in hydrodynamic simulations of neutron star mergers that a non-zero value of this lambda tidal deform deformability parameter are imprinted uh, in a crucial way in, in uh, the gravitational wave wave observations. And in particular, a result I will be using is that uh, assuming that the neutron stars that were merging in, in this August 2017 event were not spinning very fast, LIGO and Virgo provided this estimate that the tidal deformability of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star should be between 70 and 580 
at a 90% credibility. So this is, is a number that we have taken from, from this LIGO and Virgo paper, assuming it to be correct. So of course, this is a 90% uh, credence limit. So, so there is a non-zero possibility that, uh, that lambda is beyond this interval. But, but at the accuracy that these kinds of calculations are done in, in any case, I think it's, it's fairly safe to assume that the, the tidal deformability is indeed inside this window. Now, how do we combine everything that I have been discussing so far, the sort of ab initial results for, for uh, the equation of state to these observational, observational data? Now here, uh, we use this interpolation method that we have been pioneering for, for quite some time. Uh, the idea here is, is simply that we take the low density equation of state from chiral effective theory calculations the high density equation of state from perturbative QCD calculations. And then we generate very, very large ensembles of equations of state that somehow connect these two limits. There are various ways of, of doing this interpolation. The simplest perhaps is to divide this density interval to many different parts and then assume that a polytropic equation of state uh, sort of approximates the true equation of state everywhere. And then we, of course, enforce uh, conditions like, like the smoothness of the matching of the equation of state to interpolate the equation of state to, to these high and low density limits and, and uh, co the continuity of both the pressure and the number density of, of baryons everywhere with the exception of one point where we, of course, have to allow a possible first order transition. And in addition, we, we naturally also demand that the speed of sound cannot exceed the speed of light. Now, uh, this kind of an approach with four part uh, polytropes, quadrotropes, so to say, uh, this kind of a calculation was, was presented by us very uh, soon after the, the results from this, this 2017 uh, neutron star merger came out. We generated an ensemble of about 200,000 viable neutron star matter equations of state, obtaining these turquoise bands for the equation of state and the mass radius radius relation. And then what we did was start to enforce these sort of observational constraints one by one. So the simplest uh, observation one can of course take into account is the fact that we know that two solar mass neutron stars exist. This immediately removes a part of the, this MR cloud where the, the MR curves do not uh, reach this two solar mass line. And, and basically what this does to the equation of state band is that it removes equations, equations of state that are very soft at low densities because uh, those, those equations of state would not support two solar mass stars. And once you do this, once you discard these unphysical equations of state, then you immediately notice that for instance, for 1.4 solar mass stars, there's immediately a fairly non-trivial lower limit for the radius of the, of the stars, which is about 10 kilometers or so. Now next, we took the tidal deformability limits into account, excluding those equations of state where the tidal deformability is either below 70 or above 580. And here it turns out that it's this 580 limit that, that uh, is, is a non-trivial one. Uh, excluding these equations of state and mass radius curves, we uh, predominantly end up excluding equations of state that are overly stiff at low densities that would lead to, to uh, sort of neutron stars with large radii and large, um, large tidal deformabilities. And it actually turns out that there's a fairly tight connection between the radius of a 1.4 solar mass star and the tidal deformability of, of the same star. This, uh, in, essence, in essence, this uh, LIGO and Virgo result was uh, provided us an upper limit for the radius of, of uh, neutron stars. And, and the upper limit for 1.4 solar mass stars turned out to be about 13 kilometers. Now, these kind of, uh, kinds of exercises can, of course, be continued. And, and for instance, one interesting question to ask would be, what would happen if we knew accurately the, um, the radius of a neutron star with a given mass. 
so this is uh, this pink pink uh, cloud both in in this equation state plot and the, in this uh, mass radius plot is something that that um, has been obtained assuming which is actually doesn't hold true but assuming that we we knew exactly the mass of of the neutron star for which Jonas Natilas group uh, provided the radius measurement of 12.4 plus minus 0.4 kilometers. In reality, this this mass measurement was actually not not nearly uh, very accurate or th this accurate. So so this is uh, this uh, pink cloud should not be taken with uh, should not ta be taken too uh, seriously. But anyways, this is this goes to show what, for instance, a future uh, nicer measurement that's that would be more accurate that, than the one that we have we have uh, seen so far might give us if if the mass of the corresponding neutron star would be very accurately accurately known. But anyways, this was all uh, work performed already in 2017, and and now this uh, the remainder of of my talk I want to use describing in in describing a much more recent result that has to do with the existence of, of quark matter cores in, in neutron stars. So this uh, kind of qualitative idea of, of interpolating the neutron star matter equation of state from low to high densities, this we have used also uh, lately, uh, ever since this 2017 paper I, I uh, have been talking about so far, and in particular in this uh, recent work of ours, that appeared in, in Nature Physics earlier this this year, we implemented this interpolation calculation in a slightly different form. Namely, we started from the uh, speed of sound squared of neutron star matter. We did a piecewise linear linear uh, interpolation for this quantity using uh, between four and, and seven uh, different uh, density density. Uh, regimes or, or density intervals and then we in, integrated the equation of states from here. We of course check that this leads to, to results that are very accurately identical to results obtained from different different types of, uh, of interpolations but the reason why we wanted to start this time from the speed of sound squared is that this uh, kind of an interpolation gives us access to more physical quantities than the equation of state itself. So we, we are now able to, to uh, sort of study what happens uh, to the equation of state and other quantities also uh, kind of as a function of, of quantities like the latent heat of the deconfinement transition, the maximal value of the speed of sound squared and so on. Now uh, perhaps our main motivation so to say for this, for looking at, at the speed of sound squared is that there is, is quite an interesting tension between what is the standard law in neutron star physics and, and nuclear physics, and on the other hand, in the study of, of high temperature quark gluon plasma. So I uh, mentioned already earlier that, that we know that for, uh, for high temperature quark gluon plasma, the speed of sound uh, in, in the deconfined phase is a monotonously increasing function, and it approaches the conformal value of one over square root of three or, or one over three for the speed of sound squared monotonously from below. Now, on the other hand, um, at high density in, in many nuclear matter model calculations, the speed of sound uh, is known to take very high values, values very close to one or in, in some cases even exceeding one, which is, is clearly an unphysical feature of the calculations. But uh, sort of in any case, quite universally, the speed of sound is assumed to take on values which are way, way higher than this conformal value of one over square root of three. Now, uh, how to somehow reconcile this? I mean, of course, it's, it's not at all impossible that this is what happens in nature, that, that indeed the speed of sound is, is very high at high densities and, and just stays low at, at high temperatures. But ne nevertheless, it's, it's sort of intriguing to also speculate whether this one over square root of three might be of some more universal value. And indeed there have been papers claiming that this uh, conformal value for the speed of sound might even be a universal upper limit for this quantity. That even at high densities, 
the speed of sound could not increase this or, or go above this value of, of one over square root of three. Now, uh, performing our interpolation calculation, starting from the speed of sound, what it enables us to do is, is uh, essentially what is shown in this figure. So this is exactly the same kind of a kind of a uh, equation of state plot the, giving the pressure as a function of energy density that I have been showing you already already previously. But now we are able to ask the question: What happens if we knew that the maximal value that the speed of sound squared can obtain at any density is is not one, not the speed of light, but for instance 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, or even this conformal value of of one over three. And now the, the curious thing that you can see immediately from here is that if indeed this conjecture that uh, Cohen, uh, Chairman and Nilore uh, put forward was true that the speed of sound squared could never go above one over three, that would immediately tell us that we basically know the, the equation of state of neutron star matter to very, very high accuracy. Then only this dark blue band in here would remain viable. And, uh, and this is, of course, a very, very sort of appealing possibility <laughs> with the only caveat being that we don't really know whether this, this suggestion about a non-trivial non -trivial, uh, upper limit for the speed of sound holds true or not. But in addition, there is also something else that you might notice from this, this figure, which is at least very suggestive. So especially this, this low speed of sound, sound equations of state they continue with more or less the same slope as, as this nuclear matter CET equation of state. Uh, while then something qualitative seems to be happening here, maybe around here, maybe around here, but anyways, in the ballpark of energy density is of the order of, of perhaps 500 MeV over Fermi cubed over or so. And then at high, very high densities, again, this, especially this low speed of sound, sound uh, equation of state curves or, or their family seems to be almost linear and, and have the same slope as the PQCD uh, equation of state at very, very high density. So somehow this is at least suggestive of maybe this kind of a kink that have, takes place somewhere around here. Maybe this could have something to do with the deconfinement transition. At least this is a very, very appealing thought. And indeed, if you overlay to this figure uh, curves that, that uh, are taken from every single viable uh, neutron star matter model equation of state that we could find, we went through the Compost database and, and all the other public, publicly available databases bases we could find, only discarding equations of state that either do not support two solar mass neutron stars or giving too high values for for the tidal deformability of a 1.4 solar mass neutron star, what we see is that these uh, indeed continue with the same slope, meaning the same uh, polytropic index, index gamma that the CET equation of state has. Gamma is about 2.5 everywhere in here, while at high densities, this uh, pretty much every single one of, of our our uh, interpolated equations of state seem to have a gamma polytropic index of the order of one, which is the prediction from conformal field theory. Now, obviously there are some, some non-trivial questions here. It might be that this sort of seeming two slope structure is only a property of, of these bands, or it could be that it, it persists even when we start looking at the different interpolated equations of state one by one. Also, it's not, not at all clear whether this is only a feature of the low speed of sound equation of state or whether it even holds true for larger values of, of the maximal value of CS squared. And finally, of course, it's a very interesting question. Where do the centers of maximal mass neutron stars lie in comparison with, for instance, uh, the, the centers of, of uh, 1.4 solar mass stars in this, in this figure? I mean, if, if it, for instance, turned out that the one point uh, that, that the maximal mass star centers all lie below this this kink region in here, then we could 
or at least it would be very appealing to conclude that that uh, quark matter cannot be found inside any neutron stars. Now to answer these questions, what we did was we generated a very large ensemble of, of uh, these interpolated viable neutron star matter equations, equations of state with the speed of sound method. We allowed then a first order phase transition at some density, a completely unfixed random density with, with arbitrary latent heats, delta epsilon. And then we compared the behaviors of, behaviors of three different quantities, the pressure itself normalized by the, the free theory Fermi-Dirac pressure, then the speed of sound squared and this polytropic, polytropic index. And we compared uh, somehow the predictions of our interpolated equations of state with the predictions of all these, these viable nuclear, uh, nuclear matter model equations of state that I already showed you. And then finally, uh, what we did was we tried to identify some kind of an approximative criterion for when the onset of quark matter happens and, and then uh, try to somehow quantify the conditions where quark matter cores could be present and, and where not. And also how much quark matter there would be inside, inside different types of neutron stars. Good. So what do the results look like? Um, we, uh, I will start this from, from a very simple looking, looking graph. Here we are plotting all the public, publicly available viable uh, model equations of state for nuclear matter in, in this 3D plot where we have the pressure as this horizontal axis, uh, the, the gamma or the polytropic index as, as this other, other axis and then the vertical axis is, is the speed of sound squared. Now the way to look at these, these curves is that when we start from low densities, we are here at very low values of, of the speed of sound. And then we, when we increase the density, we go up in here. And, and uh, then of course, both the pressure increases, which is maybe a little bit difficult to see from here, but also gamma typically changes a little bit. Now, uh, and, and finally, I should mention that there is also this PQCD limit where we know that the the neutron star matter equations of state have to end up at some point at, at presumably very, very high values of, of, uh, of density. Now the first question to ask is where are the centers of 1.4 solar mass neutron stars and then maximally massive neutron stars? And this is the answer to that question. For these nuclear matter equations of state, this is, is the region where the 1.4 solar, solar mass star centers fly at fairly low values of, of, uh, of CS squared, while for, uh, for the maximal mass stars, the, uh, we, we see the star centers here at, at substantially higher values of CS squared. So there's clearly very little overlap between these, these families and we have very clearly separated centers of, of, uh, sort of low mass neutron stars and, and high mass neutron stars. Now, when we add our interpolated equations of state here, then we see that they're, well, first of all, <laughs> things seem very messy. We have these interpolated equations of state more or less everywhere, at least seemingly. Uh, I should note that here I'm only showing a couple of thousand, thousand of our, our interpolated equations of state, but these are, uh, form a very uh, sort of uh, representative set of all the 500,000 equations of state. State is just that if I showed every single one in here, then this, this figure would be a very difficult one to, to uh, interpret. But now the, the sort of crucial observation comes next. What happens when we uh, sort of place on every single interpolated equation of state the, these similar looking diamonds or, or circles that represent the centers of 1.4 solar mass stars and maximal mass stars? What happens is this, uh, the centers of 1.4 solar mass stars turn out to lie, lie here at moderate values of the, the speed of sound again, but most importantly, the, there is a perfect overlap between the, the uh, sort of set of our interpolated equations of state and this nuclear matter model equation of state. There is absolutely no reason to, to uh, 
doubt that we are safely in the nuclear matter phase in here. This, uh, I mean, what we get from our model independent calculation is, is uh, perfectly in line with the predictions of, of these nuclear matter model calculations. But clearly the same is not true if we look at maximal mass stars. By far the bulk of all the, the sort of centers of our uh, of, of maximal mass stars obtained from our uh, interpolated equations of state lie here at fairly low values of, of the speed of sound squared. Many of them actually relatively close to, to the conformal value of one over square root of three or one over three for, for speed of sound squared. Now, of course, this is a messy 3D plot. It's, it's perhaps a little bit difficult to, to sort of get quantitative uh, make quantitative statements from here, but what I can easily do is project these results to two different two-dimensional two plots or two-dimensional planes on the left-hand side or in, in both, uh, on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the vertical axis is gamma, the polytropic index, but here on the left-hand side, the vertical axis is P over P Fermi Dirac, and on the right-hand side, the horizontal axis is, is uh, the speed of sound squared. And this shows us very nicely the fact that what I was saying before. For, for the centers of 1.4 solar mass stars, there is an almost perfect overlap between, between our predictions and the nuclear matter model predictions. And uh, on the other hand, for the maximal mass stars, these families of points are very clearly separated. Now this is all very robust, but but then uh, the next statement is, is something that's that's already a little bit more speculative. If one had to uh, choose some kind of a simple criterion for what we call nuclear matter and what we call quark matter, there are of course many different choices that you can make here. What we made in order to be able to to make plots that quantify questions like when do we have quark matter, how much quark matter we have in different stars, and and so on, we picked a value of gamma, which is exactly in between this conformal value of one and the CET value of 2.5. And this quite nicely separates again, this, uh, this um, uh, sort of interpolated star centers from, from the predictions of, of nuclear matter models. Now using this criterion of gamma equals 1.75 to separate nuclear matter from quark matter, what we obtain is, is results that show us that first of all, everything depends on the maximal value of the speed of sound very, very, uh, sort of very, very much. So if we knew somehow that the speed of sound squared was always fairly low, for instance, point, uh, below 0.5, then we would immediately see that uh, maximal mass neutron stars would not only always contain quark matter cores, but they would actually contain very sizable quark matter cores with radii of the order of several kilometers. On the other hand, if we ask the question, when are purely hadronic uh, neutron, star, neutron stars or ne neutron star cores uh, possible even in maximal mass stars, then the uh, answer is that the two requirements that have to be met uh, separately both are that the maximal value of CS squared has to be, or be at least 0.7 and the uh, deconfinement phase transition has to be a first order one with a latent heat of, of at least of the order of 150 MeV over Fermi cubed or so. And, and what we can immediately take from here is, is in especially the, the uh, fact that if we knew that the deconfinement transition was a crossover even at low temperatures, then we would immediately independent of the behavior of the speed of sound know that uh, that quark matter cores really do exist in uh, in uh, massive neutron stars or at least that matter in the centers of massive neutron stars behaves uh, much more like quark matter than hadronic matter. And finally I promised to, to show a comparison between our calculations and and, and radius uh, recent radius measurements of course, the uncertainties in, in different radius measurements are still high, but uh, what, what I would take from here is that especially these measurements, the, the, the most uh, accurate radius measurements so far that have been 
being presented by the group of Jonas Nattilan and and others, they are perfectly in line with with uh, the low speed of sound equation of state. So certainly we don't have yet any any kind of an indication that this low speed of sound equations of state could not be be actually physical. Of course, this is, is not saying that they are physical. It's just that they, they have not been ruled out so far. Okay, so I'm, I'm running out of time. So let me just, just quickly wrap up in, in saying that um, I hope I have convinced you that, well, <laughs> the first principles description of, of dense QCD matter is, is very non-trivial and, and that there is this sort of large no man's land between low and high densities, but with a very efficient combination of, of ab initial results from, from microphysics and sort of robust neutron star observations, we are uh, sort of able to, to uh, obtain results where the uncertainties for the equ equation state and, and mass radius relation are no longer, no longer really excessive. And finally, uh, I know that there are many uh, caveats in, in our analysis uh, for, for the quark matter course. The most important one by far being this identification of gamma equals 1.75 as, as the criterion for quark matter. This is certainly debatable, but I think it's fair to say that we have, uh, we have provided uh, very suggestive evidence that uh, the possibility of having quark matter course, at least in the most massive neutron stars out there, should, should be considered uh, sort of a very likely scenario rather than just a very exotic possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi, for this uh, excellent talk. Uh, we have learned a few things. So now we'll take questions from the participants. I have seen there are already a few questions. So first one from Pratusha Varal. She has, since the core is very dense and compact, why do we expect that Minkowski and space-time QCD or any flat space-time field theory work? Should not we expect some non-trivial effects due to curvature? Uh, so the, the uh, simple answer there is that there should be effects due to curvature, but, but those effects are quantitatively still uh, very much below the uncertainties that, that we have from elsewhere. So all of this, there, there are many things that in principle could play a role. I, I think even a mo much more uh, or, or a, a much bigger effect is expected to come from magnetic fields. But even there, somehow a fairly simple, simple uh, effects and rotation is, is also one thing that one should in principle take into account. But in all of these questions, when, when you quantitatively estimate how large these effects are, you, you come up with effects that are at the most, at most of the sort of 1% level. While the uncertainties that we have from elsewhere in, in this business are, are of the order of plus minus 10% or plus minus 20%. So I would say that at some point, hopefully there will be a time when, when these kinds of questions, even the curvature one should be addressed but but that time is not really yet. So 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 we are now at, at this kind of plus minus twenty percent ballpark in the uncertainties. And once we are down to plus minus one percent, then then these kinds of questions might might be sort of much more relevant. Yeah, thanks. I think you have answered the question. Actually, I was thinking to ask about magnetic field, what you have already mentioned. Uh, I actually wanted to uh, ask you that means we have seen people talking about magnetic field means the effect of magnetic field to equation of state. But I think the effect of magnetic field will come in two places, right? Once in the equation of state itself and then in another place it will modify the stress tensor because you need to add the magnetic field and that should uh, give TOV or as uh, you want to do rotation means like, I think in the future probably people will take both means ma effect of magnetic field in both in equation of state and also in the metric right yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah certainly thank you so the next question is from uh, Prashant Zekumar uh, uh, what can you infer about quark matter in neutron star cores uh, cores assuming uh, c square is not monotonic 
for example suppose c square goes up sharply at intermediate density but then dips and goes again to the uh, conformal limit yeah okay this is an excellent question uh, i i regret that i don't have uh, plots of of our c squared behaviors available but uh, let me just mention that um that somehow we, what we did in this calculation was we allowed any possible behavior for c squared that uh sort of with the only assumption that except for one place where this sort of where this uh, possible phase transition takes place, C squared should be a continuous function. And we allowed for up to seven different intervals. So we actually, we had completely crazy behaviors for the, the for C squared that we did take into account. Like we had uh, behaviors where, where C squared goes up to, to uh, exactly unity at some low, at, at some low density, then stays there for a while, then drops to almost zero, and then goes back again and, and comes down again, and then approaches one over three from below. So we really, um, we, we certainly did not uh, assume that uh, that the speed of sound would be a monotonous function of, of density. So it's true that for um, for uh, the high temperature quark gluon plasma in the quark gluon plasma phase the speed of sound is a monotonous function but even in here you can see that when you go to lower temperatures to the hadron gas phase actually there there is a non-monotonous behavior in the speed of sound so we certainly did not make any monotonicity assumptions for the speed of sound the only assumptions were that uh, the speed of sound cannot exceed the speed of light and then asymptotically at very very high density it has to uh, approach this one over three from below thanks so the next question is from rana nandi uh, can a uh, 1.4 solar mass neutron star have quark matter core no so so this is i mean i i know here there's also, also there are all these caveats that have to do with with how we define quark matter so uh so you, you might i mean I'm, I'm sure that somebody is able to write down a model for quark matter where, where gamma is actually quite large and, and even above 1.75 and, and then you could sort of uh, you could debate whether whether uh, one of these points here could could correspond to to um, to quark matter but i would say that this is already extremely speculative so so we have seen that well, what we have seen is is that in all the different quantities that we looked at these interpolated equation of state all of them uh, are in in sort of qualitative agreement with the with the nuclear matter models in in this region where the 1.4 solar mass neutron star centers lie so, so there is uh, th there's no evidence whatsoever that that would make one uh, question <laughs> the, the phase of, of matter inside 1.4 uh, so solar mass stars. Of course, I mean th these are th these are not rigorous mathematical proofs. These are just sort of observations that we make from from generating these equation of state uh, families. But but uh, in in the accuracy of our study, I think it's it's very very unlikely that 1.4 solar mass stars would have have quark matter. The the lightest stars, I I believe. I, 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 I don't remember this exactly by heart, but I, I believe that the, the smallest mass is where we started seeing traces of this quark matter-like behavior in some equations of state where something like 1.6, 1.7 solar masses. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So the next question is a little bit similar. So, but it was the question that from Shantan Sharma that is it possible to observe evidence of quark matter inside cores? within the uncertainties i think he means observational uncertainties yes so, so the, this is of course a uh, good very good question and, and uh, i mean I, I should really emphasize the fact that we are not claiming that we have a sort of smoking gun this is not an observation of quark matter by any means we, wh what we are providing is, is uh, evidence supporting the possibility that that massive neutron stars contain uh contain uh, quark cores 
so uh, what we have seen is that it's there are very few interpolated equations of state where where uh, sort of matter do doesn't behave like quark matter inside inside uh, maximally massive stars. But of course, uh, in order to be able to claim any kind of a discovery, one would have to be able to eliminate all these. Uh, I mean, you, you can even see it from from this figure that there are some some individual uh, equations of state where the maximal mass stars, this is filled uh, red dots where they actually lie here at very high values of, of C squared and, and overlap with this nuclear matter, matter model uh, predictions. So I think that the, I mean, what, what one would need to make, make this more robust is, I mean, of course, but it, it's possible that the way that quark matter cores are, are actually observed one day is, is from some completely different type of a thing. It might be that in, in, in neutron star mergers, there's a certain type of, of uh, effect observed in, in, uh, in the post-merger phase, for instance, that, that can, not, can only be explained with quark matter effects or so, something like this. But if in order to use our machinery to really sort of uh, claim that we, we now know that there is quark matter inside maximal mass stars, it would really require um, being able to show that that uh, either there is no um, critical point on on the QCD phase diagram that that the transition is is uh, crossover even at zero temperature, or being able to somehow rigorously show that the speed of sound cannot exceed uh, the speed of sound squared cannot exceed something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So so these these kinds of results would then in in our methodology allow us to make these kinds of statements but so far i i think the more i i would even think that most people in in nuclear theory actually do believe that it's there is a strong first order transition and the speed of sound goes to very high values and then of course we we cannot make any definitive statements thanks uh, alexis so the next question is from rudra priyadash how do we measure the radius of the neutron star? Well, I, uh, I'm certainly not a. I mean, the, the, this is not my expertise. I'm, I'm a sort of yes. QCD theorist. I, I do perturbative QCD, but, but uh, so, so. The, the, yeah, if, yeah the, this question should mind, be posed to uh, one yeah. of these. Yeah, yeah I Sorry? might comment yeah. later if you don't yeah. mind. So there are, uh, in this slide, that we, you can see that. As from modeling uh, the X-ray burst means there are a few ways means uh, by modeling X-ray burst hotspot or if it is accreting neutron star you can model the gravitational rate shift of X-ray absorption lines. So there are few different uh, methods from X-ray astronomy, but they all give a um, not very accurate. So that is why you see a large error bar in both mass and radius. So, uh, and in the morning, Natalia Leonenska uh, talked about nicer results. So that talk is available in YouTube. Uh, perhaps you can see that if you missed that uh, talk. Okay. So, uh, uh, Alexis, the next question is from Ritam Malik. Uh, does your result depends on the number of piecewise polytrope? Um, yeah, good, good question. Um, in essence, um, it, it depends if you stay as low as something like two or three polytropes. Uh, even going from three to four, there's a small effect. But this is so. So here, uh, you can basically see what happens when you go from sort of bi tropes to to three tropes, and and uh, so so the so you you could even say that there's a fairly small small effect uh, e even here but but somehow what we have wanted to be very very conservative here and that's why we we have used a high number of of uh, of um, sort of these intervals where we where we do do the the interpolation and our um, 2018 prl used four tropes and, and there we, we were still able to see a bit of an effect going from three tropes to, to four tropes. But, but it seems, uh, at, at least from, from the small runs we've done with, with uh, polytropes with five, uh, 
five uh, intervals, it seems that at that point there's in practice no no effect at all. I'm sure that if I mean, th this is always a little bit um, it's, it's a tricky thing in the sense that I'm sure that if you if, if you allow this number to go to infinity, so to say, if if you really meaning that you you could just uh, draw by hand any kind of a curve, I'm I'm sure that there would be some uh, sort of crazy uh, behaviors that would would then lead to noticeable effects in in our results. But but one sort of uh, I I think the short answer to to the question is that it's uh, the way we have performed these interpolations is is uh, very conservative and and uh, I think it's relatively far fetched that increasing these parameters would have any kind of a sort of qualitative effect on on the results anymore. So so uh, but 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 it's it's of it's a delicate thing and and when we do, did this speed of sound interpolation, we actually used even higher values of for, for this uh, number of, of of intervals, mainly because we wanted to allow the speed of sound to to behave in a in a um, sort of uh, in as general a way as as possible. But of course, it's I mean there's this uh, also a trade-off between being able to to uh, generate enough equations of state and and using a very, very complicated uh, parameterization for them. But of course, it's if, if somebody wants to, to repeat these kinds of calculations with even larger numbers of, of intervals and so on, that would would be really great. I mean, that, that's certainly, I, 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 my prediction is that you won't see any any noticeable effect, but it, it of course would be nice to, to, I don't know, generate 10 million equations of state using five drops or, or something like this. Yeah, thanks. So that, Last question from Devarati Chatterjee. Uh, could the results of interpolation between nuclear and PQCD change for any other interpolation scheme than linear? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, so the results of interpolation between your nuclear and yes. uh, PQCD matter, uh, will it change if you use any other interpolation scheme rather than the linear one? Okay, so uh, I I take it that this question has to do with our uh, speed of sound interpolation because that's the only place where we use the linear uh, piecewise linear uh, interpolation for for this for these other uh, calculations we always use polytropes which of course are slightly slightly different. Um, so uh, of course the reason why we use the piecewise linear interpolation method was simplicity. It's uh, it was easy to generate this this uh, piecewise linear equations of state and and then integrating the the equation of state from there was also also simple. Now uh, we have not tried other ansatzes or ansets there, but but the way we have made sure that there should not be any kind of a bias from this choice choice of piecewise linear speeds of sound is that we compared uh, the equation of state bands that we obtained. To polytropes and also to, to uh, so-called Chebyshev polynomials, uh, so, and and uh, we always found consistent results. Actually, the speed of sound interpolation was the one that provided the largest bands for 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 the equation of state and and other quantities. So um, so e even though in principle one could, I mean, this is. Yet another thing that one could, in principle, try using some kind of an other basis for for the speed of sound. I, I think it's we have seen very convincingly that we have sort of saturated. I mean, where, the way we do this, the way we generate these large ensembles of equations of state is that we we don't fix the the um, sizes of the intervals. We don't fix the the densities where we go from one interval to to the other, but we actually randomly generate the lengths of 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 these different intervals and and uh, what, what we have seen is that when, when uh, that somehow the all of our results saturate way before we, we reach the number of of uh, of uh, sort of interpolated equations of equations of state that we have been using. Meaning that if you go if you went from five hundred thousand to one million, you would not see any change in our our results. And I think this is a fairly fairly convincing evidence for for they also that they, they should also not be any 
any kind of a change if we if we slightly change the form of of the ansatz. Thanks, thanks, Alexi. Um, so we have that was all the questions so thank you thank very you. much for this excellent talk and answering all the questions so no thank you very much for